Welcome back everyone to another Space News Summary with me. Every single Monday we recap all things Starship, spaceflight and events from the past 7 days and we've got lots of ground to cover today so let's just get right into things. SpaceX have been focusing a lot of their attention on completing Booster 7. Last week it had its aero covers installed over its COPV tanks. Booster 7's COPV tanks, of course, are placed rather differently to those on Booster 4. As you probably know, Booster 4 has its tanks here, underneath these panels. There are four of these placed symmetrically around the booster, and they each house two COPV tanks. Booster 7 is different in that its COPV tanks are contained in just two clusters, rather than four, and they're placed vertically rather than side by side, resulting in a narrower profile and reducing drag while also generating lift to help during the ascent. Check out these before and after pictures taken by Starship Gazer. For anyone new to Starship news, the COPV tanks themselves provide the gas used to start up the central engines of the booster during both the boost back and landing burns. The outer engines are fed directly through the launch table itself, as these only need to fire up once during the launch. Now we've had some news regarding the first orbital flight and whether or not Ship 20 and Booster 4 will be used. I've been saying for a while in these videos that at this stage it's highly unlikely that these two vehicles will ever fly, something corroborated by various internal sources at SpaceX. It looks like now this has been officially confirmed. Elon tweeted that the first Starship orbital flight will be with Raptor 2 engines, not Raptor 1, which is the engine that currently powers Booster 4 and Ship 20, and neither of these vehicles would be compatible with Raptor 2. Furthermore, Elon directly confirmed that the orbital flight test would indeed be with new prototype vehicles and not Booster 4 and Ship 20. So yes, rest in peace Flight 420. It is a shame, the name Flight 420 is of course an epic Keanu Reeves Thanos Pickle Rick meme name, but progress is progress, and at this stage, Raptor 2 is light years ahead of Raptor 1, to the point where there would be little to gain from flying 420, and of course there would be a higher chance of rapid unplanned disassembly, which would of course necessitate a full investigation and could potentially damage stage 0, all of which would add even more delays to the first orbital flight. Elon stated that he hopes the new orbital flight test will be in May, although realistically speaking we're probably looking at mid to late summer for the real date. Amazing then. Who could have predicted that after Ship 15 made its historic landing that we'd have to wait over a year before seeing another flight test? That is, of course, unless SpaceX decide to fly Ship 20 on its own, following a similar flight plan to Ship 8 through 15, in order to see how the heat shield holds up against the vibrations and aerodynamic forces of flight. There is also a slim chance they might want to use it to conduct a hypersonic flight test, as Elon once teased might have been an option for Ship 16. But I'm not really expecting to see any flights from either of these two vehicles in all honesty, and there's a high chance that SpaceX just want to be rid of anything using Raptor 1. Hopefully Booster 4 and Ship 20 can be immortalised in a museum so that we may all feast our eyes on this magnificent machine at some point in our lives. Now, this isn't the only setback to the Starship orbital flight test. The FAA was expected to have completed its environmental review process by the end of March, but last week they confirmed that they would need at least another month to finalise their review. This theoretically won't impact the timeline for the launch, given that Elon hoped for a date in May, but this is now the third time the FAA have pushed the dates back. We all understand why this review is so important, but I think one of the main contentions people have here is that the FAA really should have managed expectations from the beginning. Given that they knew the number of responses received, I think we'd have all appreciated them being a little bit more upfront from the start regarding how long they realistically expected the review to take. Now, it's wild conspiracy theory time! Many folks responded to me on Twitter with the ever increasingly ubiquitous conspiracy theory that all of these delays are literally only there to ensure that the SLS makes its first flight flight before Starship. Now I hate to break it to you, but this is almost certainly not true. This is the FAA, they don't really have any stakes in NASA being first, and NASA is a government agency, not a private company that lobbies politicians, so I really don't see what incentives they would have in ensuring that they're first. Oh, and a much smaller vocal minority claim that all of these delays are due to Joe Biden, which is just really funny. <laughs> Anyway, moving along, I really like this picture taken by Siununes Images that really highlights the scale of Ship 20. The caption here is human for scale. 
Can you see them? That's today's challenge. Comment below if you can find them. And hey, if you're enjoying the video so far, then don't forget to drop a like and hit subscribe. It's totally free, really helps support what I do, and it ensures that you always get these space news updates sent straight to your feeds. I'm a big fan of the work by Eric X and Small Stars. Their work features prominently in space this week. I've used this animation of a starship deploying Starlink satellites quite a few times now. Well, they've just released this beauty, showing how a cargo starship might deploy Starlink V2 satellites, based on images we've seen of a prototype barrel section with a small cargo door. It looks like a starship could deploy satellites a bit like a giant steel Pez dispenser. Go follow Eric and Small Stars on Twitter, they never fail to share great stuff. Kyle Montgomery shared some photos of the SpaceX Roberts Road facility taken from the Kennedy Space Center bus tour. This white building here looks like the one from the environmental assessment, which is a hangar for Falcon maintenance and storage. I'm not sure if this is still the plan, with SpaceX shifting more priority towards Starship, but it wouldn't be unreasonable for SpaceX to still want some capacity to support Falcon, as it's going to be a few years before it's completely phased out for Starship. Kyle also captured some shots of more tower pieces, confirmation that work on Mechazilla 2 is progressing as planned. On Tuesday, SpaceX moved their can crusher test structure over to the orbital launch complex. Starship Gazer caught a video of the big move. This structure is used to test the Max Q forces on booster tank sections. We're not 100% sure what SpaceX are planning to use this for, but sections of a new SN7 style test tank have been spotted at the build site bearing the insignia. B7.1. So many are speculating that this prototype, when built, will be a 33 Raptor engine test tank. As magnificent as the full Starship stack was, all good things must come to an end, and Ship 20 was de-stacked last week using the chopstick catch arms. Crews then began preparing Booster 4 for removal as well, and shortly afterward it was lifted off the launch pad, presumably for the final time, though this was done using the crane rather than the arms. Our best guess as to why the arms have never been used to move Booster 4 is because Booster 4 doesn't have the correct lift points to attach to the chopsticks. I would imagine that Booster 7 and onward though will all be chopstick compatible. Now check out this awesome clip captured by the Solar Dynamics Observatory spacecraft. This was filmed over the course of 9 hours. Every second of this footage is about 10 minutes in real time. What you're watching here is loops of superheated plasma flare up over the surface of the sun, a phenomenon known as coronal rain, or sometimes as a post-flare loop or plasma rain, which is created when hot plasma in the sun's corona is cooled and condensed along strong magnetic fields. What's hard to comprehend here is the scale of what's happening. These plasma beams are many times more massive than the Earth, as this helpful graphic illustrates. And although this is a time lapse, they're still moving at a really fast pace, about two to three Earth diameters every second. Absolutely crazy stuff. Now, I should mention that this was actually filmed in 2013, but I've seen it shared around on Reddit and Twitter quite a lot over the past week for some reason, so I figured that if it's generated a lot of interest on social media recently, then perhaps the audience of this show might enjoy seeing it as well. Last week, on Tuesday, we saw a Soyuz 2.1 launch from the Plesetska launch site in Russia. The payload for this mission was a single Meridian M10 satellite. These are mixed use for civilian and military applications, and are owned and operated by the Ministry of Defense of the Russian Federation. These satellites are placed into a Molnia orbit, which is a highly elliptical orbit, and the name Molnia comes from the Soviet Molnia series of satellites, which have used this type of orbit since the mid-1960s. The Meridian satellites are placed into such an orbit because it allows them to remain visible from Arctic areas for a large part of their orbit, areas which are typically poorly served by geostationary telecommunications orbits. These satellites are therefore mainly used to provide links with ships and planes operating in the Arctic Ocean, as well as stations based in the Far East and Siberia. The Soyuz launch from Plesetska launch site, which is located in Russia, and this launch site is starting to get more and more use from Russia. Traditionally, the primary launch pad used by Roscosmos is the Baikonur launch site, but this is actually located in Kazakhstan. When it was built, Kazakhstan was part of the Soviet Union. But I wonder if the Kazakh government would have any ability to block Russia's use of the spaceport in protest of the ongoing invasion of Ukraine. Russia currently have to rent the spaceport from Kazakhstan for the equivalent of 115 million US dollars per year. I don't really know what the terms are with this contract, perhaps you do, although I'd imagine it's probably confidential. I'd love to read comments down below about this. And of course, with the collapse of the ruble's value, I wonder if Russia can continue to afford paying for use of the site. I'd expect to see usage of both the Plesetska and the relatively new Vostochny Cosmodromes start increasing considerably. 
In a rather pathetic attempt at showing strength, the Soyuz this time launched with the letter Z on the side, which is a symbol used by those in support of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Okay guys, I'm sure if you ask really nicely, the farmers that keep stealing your tanks will return them to you. <laughs> I mean, there are just so many videos of farmers stealing tanks. There's like, there's like an entire subreddit about it. And now there's a, now there's a video game that's free online. It's just, it's just wonderful. <laughs> Now, I've been following Twitter user Rooklan for a wee while now. She posts really nice updates regarding the status of Falcon 9 boosters. With so many in the fleet, it can be hard to keep track of what SpaceX is up to with these vehicles. The colours of these squares indicate the type of mission. You can see the red Starlink squares really dominate the picture, really. You can also see that B-1051 is just edging ahead of B-1058 and 1060, with a record 12 missions in total. B-1049 is not too far behind but sadly it will never catch up as we've had confirmation that its next mission will be a fully expendable one and SpaceX are currently in the process of removing all of the hardware associated with stage recovery. Still, a total of 11 missions is nothing to be snuffed at and quite frankly I think it's amazing that these boosters are making it to the double digits at all when it comes to the number of flights. Anyway, I think I'm going to leave this week's space update there. I really hope you enjoyed it and if you want to help support this content by signing up to my Patreon or to the channel membership program then you'll have your name in the spotlight like these generous folk on the left do. If either of the video suggestions on screen look interesting to you then do check those out as well and I'll hopefully see you on Saturday for my next Kerbal video. It's taking a little bit longer than expected but I think you're going to really enjoy it when it's done. I'm going to sign off there. Thanks for flying with me today and I'll see you next time.